So just to recap, the event is the DNA, which is full of exons and introns, is going to be transcribed. And as it gets transcribed, it's going to be uh, forming an hnRNA, which will get processed into an mRNA. The mRNA is made up of the exons only that are stitched together. Right? So your gene is made up of the introns and exons, but it's really the exons that are expressed in the protein. Okay? And then the next stage I'll talk about is translation, where the codons of the mRNA are each representing an amino acid, and those amino acids are then polymerized into a polypeptide chain, which forms a protein. Okay? What's interesting to note is that the process that happens in a eukaryote versus a prokaryote is different. In a eukaryote, because there is a membrane between the nucleus and the cytoplasm, there's a whole bunch of extra steps that are involved in getting the mRNA out of the nucleus into the cytoplasm. We have this transcript, processing, and out the cytoplasm for translation. In a prokaryote, however, eukaryote, in a prokaryote, however, the a lack of the nucleus allows the DNA to be transcribed immediately into mRNA without any transcripts, and then that in turn is translated into the protein. So the prokaryotic process is far simpler than the eukaryotic process. So you should be aware of that difference. So that brings us to the third chunk, and this chunk is translation. So this is the second part of the central dogma of molecular biology. For us to understand what's going on here, we need to review our, 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 our RNA. It's hard to say. Can you say that 10 times? R, 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 N, A? R, the R, 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 N, A. Do that. R, 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 N, A, real. R, 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 N, A, real. Really real. Okay, wait, um, let me just get back to the lesson. So, when we look at our RNA, the ones I've talked about already are the HNRNA, and it's being processed into mRNA. And that's going to represent the template, which is going to allow the translation event to occur. But there are also other important RNAs as well, including the tRNA, which stands for transfer RNA. Look at its structure. It's very, very specific. Right? This is conserved across many organisms. It's got the reading from the 5 end all the way to the 3 end. At the 3 end, the amino acid is able to bond. So this is the amino acid binding site. On the 5 end, you'll notice that it's a little shorter than the 3 end. It has these very distinctive arms. And then on the bottom, the part that's interacting with the mRNA, we have a very important sequence known as the anticodon. And the anticodon needs to match the codon. It's going to be a complementary RNA sequence to the codon. If the codon reads C-U-U, the anticodon is A-A-G. Notice I read it A-A-G, not G-A-A, -A, because I always read in a what direction? 5 to 3. Always, always, always. Right? 5 to 3. So C-U-U, A-A-G, the anticodon. That's your transfer RNA. And then finally, the other rRNA that is responsible for the production of proteins is the ribosomal RNA. And the ribosomal RNA is what makes up the ribosomes. And the ribosomes are the machinery that allow the whole translation event to occur. All right. Now, these rRNAs, whether or not it's M or rRNA or tRNA, they're all transcribed from the DNA. Okay. So RNA polymerase 1 is responsible for creating rRNA. RNA polymerase 2 is responsible for producing hnRNA, which we saw here, and RNA polymerase 3 is responsible for producing tRNA, of which there must be, if there's 20 amino acids, then you'd expect there to be at least 20 RNA polymerase um, uh, tRNAs. There's actually a whole bunch of different codons, so knowing that there's a bunch of different codons, there could be six that code for leucine, you might expect there to be more than one tRNA for leucine, for example. Okay. Now the process of translation proceeds through several stages. Those key stages include the charging of the tRNA, the initiation, elongation, termination, processing, done. Okay, so it's very similar to replication and transcription in its, um, its thought and process. 
So let's start from the beginning. Let's start with the trans, uh, the charging of the tRNA. The tRNA itself. So I kind of explained a little bit about its um, structure. I was making sure I don't have one here. So the structure we're good with, right? We got the amino acid binding site, which is the long site, which is the three. The three is the longer, the five is the shorter. We have these arms and we have an anticodon. Okay. So with your tRNA, the um, names are on the PowerPoint, so make sure you know them. And the tRNA process requires an amino acid being put to the tRNA. So what allows that to happen is another very special enzyme known as the amino acid tRNA synthetase. Well, that's a mouthful. And the amino acid tRNA synthetase, it makes sense, right? Amino acid tRNA synthetase, putting it together, so it's not that complicated. It's going to bond the two. Remember, this is an anticodon. So this anticodon is going to not be the same thing you see on the genetic table here. So I'm not going to be true to the anticodon. I'm just going to demonstrate how, how this would work, right? Uh, UUC, UUC is leucine, okay. And the anticodon for UUC here is going to be what? It's going to be GAA, GAA. So that's the anticodon. The AGU, let's look at the table here, if you guys can see it. Let's move these things out of the way. Make my table a bit bigger. So my AGU, A, G, U, A, G, U, is serine. So serine is AGU. So I'm just going to just kind of match it up right here. And what's the anticoder for AGU? It's going to be A, C, U. So this is the... T, um, tRNA for this codon. So serine needs to be bound to this transfer RNA. So along, along comes an amino acid tRNA synthetase. It's going to facilitate that reaction and now it's charged. This tRNA is ready to go. And this tRNA binds leucine. So it's going to be charged and now it's ready to go. So it's charged, ready to go. And I'm assuming that this one here, um, UAC, GUA, which is going to bond, if you look at G, U A is it G U A well I don't have the right one here but it's going to bond uh, an amino acid and that's going to facilitate the reaction and now we have a charged a charged um, tRNA so that's the very first step um, one of the first steps the tRNAs need to be charged with their amino acid and that will allow them to be a part of the the protein machinery. Okay, so that's step number one. Now, something interesting can occur. I've been talking about this uh, codon here. See, AGU bonds ACU, right? And if I were to change this, there's something very interesting that can occur. And that is, there's a thing called the wobble phenomenon. And if I change the third letter of a codon, so if I got a codon here, and we change the th third letter from AGU to AGC or AGA or AGG, they actually all, um, in this case, they all code for the same thing. But let's say they code for the same thing. What can happen is that there's a thing called the wobble phenomenon. And in the wobble phenomenon, the third letter in the codon could be wrong and it will still bond the correct transfer RNA. And this phenomenon where the tRNA does not bond properly, but it brings in the correct amino acid to the codon is called the wobble phenomenon. And so you'll see that on the, on the PowerPoint somewhere, but that's that's what it's called. It's called the wobble phenomenon. It's the scientific name that we use. All right. Now the ribosome. The ribosome has two parts. It has a small subunit and a large subunit. Here's a small, here's a large. And depending on the organism that we're talking about, they have different names. But what is called small and large? 
The small subunit is below the mRNA, and the large subunit goes above. The large subunit has several different regions. It has a region that's going to allow the tRNA to come in, called the actrocyte. So if I group this together here, it's called the actrocyte. There's another region called the P site, which is going to form a peptide bond, so it facilitates a reaction between two amino acids. And there's another site here called the E site, which is an exit site, which basically ejects the tRNA, leaving the amino acid behind. Okay, so that is the ribosome. The ribosome is made up of rRNA. So the rRNA constructs this very complex ribosome, which is going to be a major player in the protein translation event. Let me just jump to the next screen here. It'll be easy for me to show you. So in stage one, what happens is the small unit binds to the mRNA in a region that's up upstream of the start codon, the initiating codon, the mMET. And so now you see the reason why this is called the five prime, even though when I was drawing it, it seemed to be on the three prime end because it doesn't matter what it is on the DNA, it matters what it does on the RNA as it's being translated into a protein. So this untranslated region here, it acts as a site for the, sm the small subunit of the ribosome to latch onto, so it latches on. Once this happens, I'll just delete these as I'm done with them. Once this happens, then the first tRNA with methionine comes in and it bonds. And the whole system shifts down. So it's going from the untranslated region where it latched on, it's shifting down, and in comes the meth. All right. So that is done. And then the next stage, the large subunit is going to come in. You'll notice in this large subunit, to make it easier, the E is missing, but it's, it's supposed to be there. So now the small unit with the methionine and the large unit are all joined together, and this process is ready to start. So this is the initiation. The first tRNA is in the A site, it shifts down to the P site, and now we can start elongating. So next what will happen is, in will come, a tRNA carrying the next amino acid in the chain. How does it know what the next amino acid is? Because the genetic code will tell you. UUU stands for phenylalanine, and in it comes into the A site. Between the P site and the A site, there's going to be a facilitation of a reaction forming a peptide bond. Then next, the whole ribosome will shift down, and the um, first tRNA will get ejected out, the um, second tRNA will be shifted down to the P site, and a new amino acid will be brought in thanks to this tRNA, and the P will facilitate the peptide bond. And then the glycine's coming in, because that's next. And this process will continue. Ejecting, shifting, peptide bond forming, incoming. And it'll continue until a stop codon is reached. And when a stop codon is reached, so this is now termination, when a stop codon is reached, instead of bonding a tRNA, it bonds a release factor. And this release factor bonds, it kind of ends the peptide reaction, so there's no more peptide bonds being created, and the whole assembly breaks apart. So now we have the completed polypeptide, which is not a protein yet, the last tRNA gets ejected so it can you know, collect some more amino acids and do its thing. The units of the ribosomes are disassembled. The release factor is you know, disassembled. The whole thing's disassembled. So that is translation. That's the process. Now, instead of it happening one at a time, on one single mRNA, you're going to find multiple ribosomes. And this allows the co-creation of many proteins at the same time. So this is a very effective process. If you had to wait for one protein to be created and then a second one to be created before, you know, the first one to be complete before the second one starts, that would take forever. So you have many ribosomes on a single mRNA, kind of like an assembly chain, and it allows the creation of many proteins so the pro cell can produce the product very quickly. 
this diagram here is not that important. You could skip it, but what it's doing is it's just showing you that the creation of the of the um, polypeptide incurs inside the endoplasmic reticulum. So here's the ribosome latching onto the endoplasmic reticulum, and then the the um, polypeptides being created inside the endoplasmic reticulum. That's why when, in the first unit when you guys talked about ribosomes and the rough ER and the smooth ER, the ribosomes were attached to the endoplasmic reticulum to allow the uh, creation of proteins. Okay. So that shows the pro entire process. DNA is transcribed into mRNA and the mRNA is translated into protein. The protein then leaves the cell or stays in the cell doing whatever job that protein is supposed to do. Okay. Now, there's a couple of other sites on here that I wanted you guys to take a look at. This polypeptide, when it's done, it's not actually done. There's still one more step that has to happen, and that is called post-translational post modification. So at the end, when the polypeptide is created, the polypeptide then has to be folded. So if I were to just add a slide here and to draw this on quickly, Let's draw the process again. So the first thing that happens is I have my DNA. My DNA is transcribed into HNRNA. The HNRNA is then processed into mRNA. The mRNA leaves the nucleus and it gets translated into a polypeptide. That's called PP. But this polypeptide is just a polypeptide. It still has to go through a whole bunch of modifications, which happens in the Golgi bodies and the endoplasmic reticulum. It has to be folded into its final shape, whatever that might be. And you also might get the addition of, you know, a methyl group here and a sugar here. For glyco groups, you might get some phosphorylation events that are added, and so on. So there's a whole bunch of things that happened. So this final post-translational modification, so I can write this out here, post-translational modification, this is the final step that is going to um, allow the protein to be created. Okay, and now that the final protein is created, it can leave the cell and do whatever it needs to do. Okay. So as you guys look at my PowerPoint, let me just go back to my PowerPoint here. You'll see that I've talked about all these steps, and then I gave you this site here. I really like this site. So this site has a lot of information on it, and I know that I often review it before I teach. And what they've done here is they have... Um, giving you some data and some numbers with the relative size. Like, if you compare the difference in size between a DNA and an mRNA or an mRNA and a protein, well, here's a typical mRNA that will be translated into myoglobulin. Look at the difference in size. The mRNA is huge. It's massive. It includes a poly-A tail, includes those untranslated regions, and then there's that actual sequence that gets expressed into the protein. And there's the myoglobulin. So you can see there's a, there's a remarkable difference in size between the mRNA and the protein that it codes for. So I have a link to this site. I encourage you to kind of play around with it, click on the links, and get a feel for some other things that are above and beyond what we talked about in this class. This is one of those uh, diagrams I showed at the beginning that showed relative sizes of proteins. Some are huge, some are tiny. So it depends on where we're looking at. So we'll take a look at that site. And then Mr. Desange, um, at this point, he has already released, or if he hasn't, it'll be a part of this lesson. It's a simulation that you can work through, and he's going to give you step-by-step uh, -step instructions on how to get through this. And you will get an opportunity to go through the transcription and translation process by using the very molecular machines uh, that I had talked about in this lesson. So that's another good place to play with. And another site that's excellent is this thing called the Molecular Workbench. So if you get an opportunity to download this to your computer and work through it, you'll see this one called Proteins and DNA. Another one says DNA to Protein. It is a, um, it's safe, you can use it. It is another simulation, and these are just similar, you don't have to do them all, right? You, If you're aiming for that three hour minimum, then uh, 
you've probably stopped a long time ago and you're probably not hearing me. If you are uh, trying to get full understanding, then you might work through these simulations so that you do understand the concept. So this molecular workbench, I really do like it because it does a good job of talking about the content and giving you simulations. And some of the simulations are pretty sophisticated, so that way it's more than the elementary kind of grade 9 understanding, it's really grade 12 kind of pre-university understanding. So I encourage you to kind of work through this. Uh, click on the buttons to get a full view. You'll see things like the ChemSketch. It's not ChemSketch, but it's very similar. And just work your way through the various pages, and you'll get a full understanding of the concept. If you do those two simulations and you read through the PowerPoint and ask questions in the Google Doc, then you'll be completely fine with the understanding of this. You'll see other links on the PowerPoint. I encourage you to click on any of them, on all of them, to get that full understanding. All right, and that is it. Um, the last thing I'll talk about in the next one is how do you go about transcribing and translating the gene into a protein if I were to give you the actual code?